Welcome to the latest edition of the Distinguished Speaker Series. And uh, today we have an incredible privilege of having Detavio Samuels with us, uh, current uh, CEO of Revolt. And uh, Detavio, welcome home. Thank you. It's good to be home. Yeah. <laughs> So I think most people in the audience know what that means, given, uh, given how they're clapping. But uh, of course, you, you're a Duke undergrad. Uh, first job coming out of college was uh, crossing the street, basically, and, and coming over to the business school. And so uh, this, is, this is something we've talked about. Like it, It's an emotional thing to, to have started your journey here uh, working at Fuqua and then come back and you're at the front of the room in this position, you are the first person that's ever been a part of the series who has had that, uh, oh, nice. that particular background. <laughs> so to have worked at Fuqua. <laughs> I love a first, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's really terrific. So, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into uh, the the beginning of your your job uh, as CEO at, at Revolt, which is you you took on that role just a little bit after the murder of George Floyd, and um, and it looks like uh, things have changed fairly significantly in that period of time. Um, some, some things for the better, maybe, some things for the worse. And, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. So the first thing is that uh, in your role, you, uh, you know, because you're a media guy, by the way, so he, CEO, but also media star, uh, uh, entrepreneur, marketer, you know, where's... Far from a star, but I do the other things. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so, so you're out there a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I can pick out a lot of quotes and so on from you. And, um, and one thing that, that you said is that the brand has gone from uh, where revolt is not that it's revolting, but rather it's about revolution, and has gone from music revolution to social justice revolution. So tell me about that journey with the brand, how, how you've come to make that statement. Yeah, sure. I think that um, all great brands have to have something to stand on. We were kind of having this conversation where I think the job of the CEO this, these days is almost the same as the job of a politician, where you have to have an agenda for your company that very much aligns with the agenda of your audience. And then all you have to do in the same way that someone like a pres like Trump would do is every time you are in front of that microphone, you beat the drum of that agenda. And so coming into Revolt, the question was never, what um, will we lead a revolution? The brand was called Revolt, didn't have any choice but to lead a revolution. So the only question was, what revolution will we lead? And when you look at it back then, right, you had had Trayvon Martin, uh, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, and so since 2016, there was starting to be this massive like social justice undercurrent happening. And hip hop was very loud and present um, in that kind of momentum that was being built. And then when you had the murder of George Floyd, it was like everything erupted. And so for me, it became abundantly clear. Hip hop had a natural tie to social justice. Social justice like, was a revolution that people were waiting for. And so we just seized the opportunity. I started on June 1st. George Floyd was murdered May, early May 20-something. And before I even started, grabbed the reins and said, everything we do is going to be social justice until I say stop. No advertising, no brands, it can impact our money. Like you have to find those moments where you can like break through the noise of what everybody else is doing. And so lots of people started doing social justice, especially as people were protesting kind of like early June, but then it waned. And in July, revolt was still there. And in August, 
revolt was still there. And in September, maybe in September, we were like, all right, we'll start letting our advertisers start <laughs> coming in now. We got to make some money. Um, but then at that point in time, we made a promise to never be less than 50% social justice in terms of the work that we spit out. And today, I would say our kind of thing is like maybe 25 to 35% social justice. And so that is a key revolution. And then I would argue that there are several other revolutions that are important to us that we are leading, but that is the one that gave us kind of the first jump into being who people now know us to be today. Okay. So um, on, a, on a less positive note, okay. in reflecting on the, the, the years following uh, the murder of George Floyd, um, you've called those years the, the, the illusion of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, and that what used to be tailwinds are now headwinds. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah. So the way I'll talk about it is from a historical perspective, right? So if you look at the story of America, the story pretty much always goes the same. Something happens, black people experience a moment of time of success, of achievement, they're thriving. Um, for whatever reason, the powers that be decided it is a zero-sum game. To see black people win means that other people have to be losing, and so then they destroy it, right? So if you're familiar with Black Wall Street and what happened in Tulsa, thriving black town, bl thriving black economy, they burned it down, they destroyed it, they murdered everybody who was there, period, right? We just covered, um, my team just covered Oscarville, which is where Lake Lanier is in, in Georgia. Same thing, thriving black town, winning, doing great. What did they do? Murdered everybody, dumped the lake on it so that no one would even know that it existed. Go look at um, Central Park. Used to be a black town called Seneca Village, thriving, right? The pattern is the same. And so the reason I was able to so confidently say that it was an illusion of inclusion when it, happened, when it was happening was one, because I know the history, meaning we're going to get our moment, it's going to be short-lived, and we will get back to business as usual, which is what I would argue that we're in now. So that's one reason why I was calling it an illusion of inclusion. The other reason I was calling it an illusion of inclusion was because <clears throat> the progress that was made was good progress. So like when I, I use my own company, when I first got to Revolt, if you compare what we made on advertising in 2020 to what we did in advertising in 2023, it's a 5x jump, right? Massive. You don't see those types of things happening. The truth, though, when you look at black-owned media, my category before 2020, black-owned media was 0.7% of all advertising dollars. Think about the impact that black people have on culture, on media, on entertainment, on everything. And they're getting less than 1%. And so when brands were coming out making these, these commitments, it was like, we're going to go from 1% to 2%. The illusion of inclusion. You're telling me that you're doubling the numbers, but you're going from one penny to two penny. And I know that when you get tired of us, you will stop giving us those two pennies and it'll go back to one, which is very much the world that we're in now. So that's why I was talking about it in terms of the illusion of inclusion because um, I knew what was coming, and then I knew that the commitments weren't real. If black people are 14% of the population, why can't you spend 10% with us? When you look at my company, like I measure it all, my production dollars, my team is not allowed to come in spending less than 50% of the money with people of color, women, et cetera. I measure it on a black basis, on a black woman basis. How much are you spending with black women? I can tell you right now, my team spent 33% of their dollars with black women last year. You can't find another company that's doing that, right? Um, so I'm measuring in on all of these uh, dimensions. One, because it's good for me and it's the life that I wanna live and it's true to my values. Two, I am also just trying to set a tone for the industry that like your excuses are BS to me. You're telling me that I only get to be 2% of the, of, the, of the dollars and I should be happy, but I'm spending 25% of my dollars with black women. You can't tell me you can't get the 5%, 10%. I'm supposed to jump up and celebrate with two pennies. It's not going to happen. So uh, given, given these headwinds that you just described, why is it that Revolt has so successfully navigated these headwinds? What, what have you done to keep growing 
and to be successful over that period of time? Yeah, it's a great question. Hmm. What have we done? Um, one, first and foremost, I would argue that we delivered for our customers. So advertisers being our key customers, those are the people who are paying us, we over delivered. Um, I built an agency inside of a media company that is giving our best clients like top tier service that they can't get. I don't care if you go to Disney or Warner or whoever's bigger than me, we are servicing your business better and we are taking care of your business better. So that's one. Two was this shift from cable. We were very much seen as a cable network and shifting us into this like digital reality, right? And so now our digital business, when I came, our total linear business was probably 60% of the revenue, meaning the money we get from like a Verizon and a Comcast, those types of people. Today, that business is 20% of our business and it's 80% advertising, mostly digital because we delivered for our advertisers and we made the move to digital. The last thing that I'll just say um, is we became hyper relevant. Look, I, there, I believe our level of awareness is way smaller than it should be because I don't have any dollars to put towards marketing. But when you look at just how much we resonate with the culture, how relevant we are to the culture and the people that know us, brands see that and they see that connection and they want it. Um, every brand has ever want, always wanted to chase youth culture. That's why things like Vice were big, BuzzFeed were big. All of those brands are gone. And so now I'm occupying a blue ocean space that's like, where else can you go get cool youth culture? Vice did it through more of like a edgy way. Red Bull did it through like extreme sports. BuzzFeed did it through Buzzy. I do it through black culture. But I can do black culture and I can bring the world and the DJ black, the music black, but the whole world is at the party, right? So being able to deliver not just a black audience for brands, but a multicultural youth audience for brand, which again, I don't think there's anybody else in the media game who's able to deliver that in the way that we are. That's what I think gave us the success that we've been experiencing. So you, you have said that, that really you need to shift the narrative around black people oh, and sure. We, to quote you, we have to reclaim control over our narrative right now. For sure. So that, though, is not something that is counterproductive from a business point of view. That is actually the secret sauce yeah. of the success. Yeah. Um, one, because it's a story. People don't buy products. They buy stories. And so I'm telling stories that people can hear, relate to, and get. Um, even if they look at the content and it's not the content they want, the story, the purpose, the thing we're doing is something that people very much buy into. And then my audience buys into it, which is the most important thing. I got to win with them. In order to be able to get money from advertisers, I have to win with this audience and then be able to connect to them. And this whole idea of reshaping our narrative and reclaiming our narrative is one that, that, that resonates. And, um, I'll do it real quick. I just took a glass of water. Let me do it real quick. Let me drink a glass of water and then I'm going to tell you the story real fast. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've told this story all year, so it'll be my time to like practice as I'm getting back in the game. Okay, so the story of the first racist, all right? This guy by the name of Gomez de Zarara. He was the chief historian for Prince Henry out of Portugal. Chief Henry out of Portugal. One of the first folks in Europe who learns how to sell ships and boats into Africa and is, you know, bartering for slaves, murdering for slaves, right? Bringing them back to Europe and selling them. Okay, so why is it Gomez de Zarara, the one that we call the first historian or the first racist, and not actually Prince Henry who was actually doing the work? What we call um, Gomez, we give him that title because he's the first one that made enslaving black people missionary work. He's the first person to put on paper that black people were inferior, uncivilized, and it was God's work to go down there, make them Christians, and make them whole, the first one. And this is in the late 1400s, right? So there's no New York Times back then, but whatever the New York Times is back then, like in Europe, it like explodes, right? It goes all across Europe and all of Europe begins to buy into this idea that there's an entire continent full of savages that they can just go down there, take the resources and do God's holy work in saving them, thus making them slaves. So that's the idea that people have bought into 
for the last 600 years. So then when the first black people show up in America, you don't go, oh, these are people who should get to settle here like everybody else. You go, what are they? Slaves. It's God's work. Put them in chains. Make them Christians. Fix them. 1776, all men are created equal except who? Black people. Because the idea, the story that black people are slaves, meant to be slaves, uncivilized, was still there. You can fast forward through, you know, all of the things that you know. Civil rights still get you black codes, still get you Jim Crow, still get you civil rights movement. The Berlin um, Accord, the Berlin Conference in maybe 1884, 1885, all the European leaders gather and divide an entire continent of Africa up amongst themselves like nobody is there because the people who live there are uncivilized and third class citizens. That story, that one singular story written by one person in the 1400s has followed black people for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so when you see that police officer, see that young black man unarmed, no gun, but pull his gun out and shoot him, it's not because I think he's racist. It's because he is living on 600 years of a pretty messed up story, right? When you see black men complain, I got into the elevator, white woman grabbed and clutched her purse. I don't think she's racist. I think she is the victim of 600 years of stories that tell her who we are. And so once people get to understand that narrative that has stuck with us, my point is, if you want to get people to treat us differently, you have to get them to see us differently. The way you get people to see us differently is to get them to see different stories of us. That's why you see something like a Black Panther work, right? It explodes because now black people get to see themselves on screen as kings and queens. They come from a place, Wakanda, with like precious metals and reasons. Like that story is a story we are thirsty for, but nobody will tell. And so when you say there's this little bitty company who's willing to go to war with Disney, who's willing to go to war with Paramount, who's willing to go with whoever, because we are the ones who are going to tell our stories differently, that story gets people to buy into who revolt is and to support revolt. That is how we have gotten to be successful. So these, these stories, um, you, you talk about them as a combination of mirrors and windows. Can you explain what that means? You're going to give me all my practice for the year. <laughs> I haven't spoken in so long, and so like you kind of got to like get back in the rhythm. I'm so grateful for your research, because yeah, I should be working on these stories. OK, mirrors and windows. So mirrors and windows is what I talk about when people are saying, like, oh, well, I think media is the most powerful industry in the world, hands down, point blank. It's the industry of ideas, and ideas are what make things move. You will watch your politicians, you will watch your people get on camera and give you ideas that then people hold on to. That's all media is, the industry of ideas. OK, so what are the ideas? What is the power of media? Media is both mirrors and windows. Mirrors. For the people who the story is about, it is a mirror. It's a reflection of who you are. It tells you who you are, what you're capable of, where you come from, and what's possible. For the people who sit outside of that world, it's not about your community. Um, it's a window. It's a window into this new world where I get to see who these people are, what they're capable of, what they can do, et cetera. The problem for black folks all over the world is we have never been in charge of the mirrors or the windows. And it's like waking up every day, looking at like those circus windows with like mirrors, like where everything about you is distorted, right? So the storytelling doesn't just impact the way people treat us and impacts the way that we see ourselves. Again, if you go back to a Black Panther, that's why you saw the pride. They finally saw a mirror that told them they were worthy of greatness. And we need more and more of those mirrors. And they told the rest of the world that we are worthy of greatness. They didn't want Black Panther to go into China because they said that it couldn't work. Blockbuster hit in China. One of my favorite stories about Black Panther is that, and this will be the last thing I say here, um, adoption rates for black cats went through the roof. Before Black Panther, all black cats were given away. <laughs> all black cats were given away to what you call them, like the pet shelters, right? Nobody wanted a black cat. When Black Panther came, everybody wanted a black cat, and they wanted to call him T'Challa. 
the power of an idea, the power of a story, and if it can change things for black cats, my God. <laughs> what can it do for any marginalized group, any fragmented, like, what can it do? So anyways, that's the power of mirrors and windows. Or the story so, of so that's the mirror part, but what are the, what are the windows? The windows is for everybody else. It's for everyone else to see. White people will go adopt that black cat because they no longer see blackness as being evil and wicked. They now see blackness as being something that is a connected to royalty, superhuman strength. It, it has the same impact whether you come from inside the community or outside the community. For me, Black Panther was a mirror for people who come from outside of the black community. It was a window. So in terms of those windows, um, it's clear that, that Revolt wants to tell stories about black people. Um, and again, to quote you, let's, let's be unapologetically ourselves. Then whoever wants to can come in. Yeah. And so is that the, the window? So if other people want to come in, if, they, if they're interested in those stories, if they learn from those stories, all the better. 100%. Okay, I think I want to talk about it in two ways. Let me just see real quick. Um, if people want to come in. So one way that I want to talk about it, which I kind of mentioned already, which is like hip hop. So sometimes people will see my company. They will say, we're too black. You're too black, any black, black, black. Okay. Um, one, my marketing strategy is very simple. I super serve the underserved. I don't need to super serve my white brothers and sisters. They are very well served in the marketplace. Go turn on your TV and count how many channels are black owned channels. I don't need to worry about them, right? So the first part of it is about just making sure that the core audience I have locked in. Um, so anyways, unapologetic about serving them because they are absolutely underserved. And then there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about, like the power of, I was saying like the DJ's black, the music black, and everybody is welcome in. Hip hop, the most number one stream music in the world has never had to like shift and serve somebody else. People love hip hop. Every 55 year old CMO I'm selling to, if he doesn't love hip hop, his kids love hip hop, right? So I always just tell people I'm just following the rules that hip hop has already laid out. They're not bending, they're unapologetic, and everyone comes in. Let me put on Drake right now, but everybody in the school gonna be dancing, right? Um, so if they get to do that, then I believe we get to do that, right? And that's where the power is. And, and in fact, if you look at the data for Revolt, 50% of the correct. engagement is with non-black outings. Correct, correct. We're about 50% black, a little less than 20% um, Latino, and then uh, that would leave 30% the rest, which would be mostly white, right? So the, the data, the report card says it's working. So let me shift to something that's more personal, okay. which is um, that, uh, you, again, you have a, you've got quite a paper trail out there. So, okay. um, <laughs> so you, you said the days of CEOs getting to hide behind their corner offices are gone. And so this is something you, you were not out in front before, but now you are out in front. Uh, why, what, what led you to take this position of, as CEO, I have more responsibility and I need to be visible yeah. in that role? Yeah, so, so two things. Um, first of all, my dream. My dream was I wanted to be the mob boss. Like, and when I used to think about the mob boss, I'm talking about like, the guy who's in the back of the Italian kitchen, like with all the pots and pans and everyone's like, the dude who's really calling the shots, you don't really see. He's not like out in the front trying to be seen by, like he in the back with flour being spun all around him. Like that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be powerful. I wanted to be influential, but I wanted to be hidden. <laughs> it was, was the goal. Um, what changed with this role were two things. Um, one, I was challenged by a mentor, which I'll talk about. And the second one is I just began to realize mm, it's going to connect to something I said already. But back in the days, you used to be just given credit for building a company that made a great profit. Then it was great product and a great profit. And now I believe we're in a world where you have to have great purpose, great product, and a great profit, right? The consumers who are buying your goods 
want to know that they are supporting somebody who is creating the world that they want to live in, which is how I get to this. Like, it's almost like being a politician. You have to think about the world these people want to live in. How can you flush those values and those things through your ecosystem so that you can stand in front of them credibly and say, I'm building the world you believe in. So that was one. Um, just the ability to be able to do that over and over and over and over again so that people knew what we stood for. But then two, I had a mentor um, really challenge me. And he was just like, Detavio, I don't understand why you run a television company and you don't have your own TV show. My answer, I want to be the mob boss. Like, I don't want people to know who I am. I just want to be the person who's the, uh, the wizard of all. I want to be the person in the back that's pulling the strings and nobody should know me. Fame comes at way too, too high of a cost. And his response back to me was, that's selfish. There are 16-year-old little black boys that need to know that somebody like Detavio exists. There are 20-year-old, you know, whatever, black women who are going to want to hear the stories from the people that you're going to be able to get out of them. Every day you sit in your corner in your kitchen, you are being selfish and not understanding the impact that just people knowing you exist could have. And probably not too shortly after that, I remember I was flying. I never missed flights. And I missed a flight, and I was frustrated. And I was like, oh, I was sitting at the airport, opened up my phone, looked at LinkedIn, and right hand on the Bible, God is so good, um, was a picture of a little young little black boy. And he had on a name tag, and it said, Detavio Samuels, CEO of Revolt. I don't know this black kid. I wouldn't know him if he walked by me. I don't know his mama. But for whatever reason, this little black kid knows me. And for whatever his dress up as who you want to be when you grow up day, whatever, he chose me. I don't know him. I don't know my impact. But I play for impact. And if that's the impact I can have in the world, then I'm, then I'm willing to deal with the cost that comes along with that, which means having a show I don't want, being in front of the camera in ways that I don't want, because it's bigger than me. And signing all the autographs, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> autographs if needed. <laughs> so uh, to, to follow more seriously along that, that, what you just said, you've called Revolt uh, an engine for transforming change that happens to make media. So. Uh, we are living in times that are complicated, dangerous, scary. Uh, one of the things that's so very scary is how polarized society is. So do you feel like you have a responsibility, that you and your company have a responsibility for trying to reduce that polarization and tackle that in some way? Or is that, is that someone else's job? My initial thought is someone else's job, but let's do the walk and see where my brain goes. Um, before this moment, I was not worried about polarization. I think about polarization as I'm scared about it. I swear we're ready for civil war. If like, it wasn't urban cities surrounded by red, if the lines were more easily drawn, we would have been at civil war already, right? But now we live next door to our neighbors, and it makes that thing hard. So I very much care about the fact that we are so polarized in this country. Um, okay, now whose puzzle is it? Is that my puzzle to solve? I'm a big believer that like God creates us all to be very unique human beings. And your job is to figure out what makes you unique and what makes you special. And then once you know that, to then solve the puzzles you were designed to solve. So I see the problem. Do I feel like it's my problem? What I would say is, Pre-2024, absolutely not. In fact, not that I was trying to create more polarization, um, but the role that I sat in, people will teach you in school when you're the category leader, like we're growing like hotcakes, our business is doing well, but my job is to grow the category. And if I grow the category, then we all grow. So that meant the reason I'm everywhere with so many quotes that you can pull, which again, I love that you did your homework. Um, is because my job was to stand in front of CMOs and marketers and tell them it wasn't good enough. It was to be bold. It was to be unwavering, to tell them your one penny or your two pennies are not good enough. Black people deserve and need, like, that was my job. And maybe that creates more polarization. I don't know, but I didn't care because I was solving the, the piece from my puzzle that I needed to solve. 
Today, what I would say is anybody who was going to move based on what I was saying has already moved. Meaning, if seeing George Floyd being murdered with a knee on his neck didn't get you, if other brands making commitments didn't get you, if people like myself calling you the task, holding you accountable didn't get you, then three years later, you were just in a group of people who can't be got, <laughs> right? And so then in that world, I'm trying to figure out, so then what is the new approach? What is the new story? How do you still grow this category? And what I will say is I am looking for ways that feel like unity. I'm looking for ways that feel less like us versus them or black people have been disenfranchised and oppressed in all of these ways. I'm trying to see if there's a way that can sound like this is good for all of us because we're in desperate need of that. So I think my closing kind of thought on that is I don't believe that it's my puzzle to solve. I think there's somebody brilliant maybe in this room, maybe it's somebody else's puzzle. Doesn't feel like my personal puzzle, but I, I do want to see our nation more united. I do believe that the story I need to tell in order to move my business has to be rooted in something that feels more like unity. So I'm on my way, but not purposefully, because again, it's not, I don't think that's my puzzle to solve today. Okay. So um, you, you do change. Yes. Uh, and, and maybe when I ask you that question in a year, you'll have a yeah, different answer. Yeah, that's exactly right. But uh, one, one thing that you've changed on is that uh, that you used to want to be the black Disney. Mm -hmm. And now you don't think that's such a good idea. Mm -mm. Terrible yeah. idea. Why, why is that? <laughs> um, okay, so when I first came out in Revolt, probably the first time I said it, Forbes Mag Magazine, maybe, February of 2021. So I just become the CEO in love with everything Disney has done. Like, I look at Bob Iger as just an incredible... Um, CEO and all that he's done in the worlds that he has built and pulled together. Everything from sports to news to superheroes to Star Wars to Pixar, like truly an incredible portfolio. And so um, what you learn when you're trying to raise money, and when I say money, like, first of all, congratulations to anybody who's raised money or is raising money. But when you want to raise real money, like not a million, a hundred million, a billion dollars, you can't walk into people with like small dreams, right? Um, here, here's how I say it. My old boss was Sean Combs. The first time I put the deck in front of Sean Combs saying, here's the vision and here's the strategy for revolt. You know, the first question he asked me was, how much money are we raising? Now this company that I was running was probably, let's call it worth 75 million at the time. I know him, he only dreams and thinks in magnitude. So I'm saying to myself, okay, I gotta ask for a big number, but it can't be crazy. So I say 100 million. For 100 million, you could have bought Revolt. You didn't even need to invest in us. You could have just bought the whole company and did whatever you want with it. He kicks it back to me and goes, don't need to look at it, not big enough. Anything that only takes 100 million dollars is not big enough to change the world, go back, right? Um, so that's the world that I'm living in. So I'm trying to find big dreams that can get people excited, that can give you hundreds and whatever. So Disney, $70 billion in revenue, you know, probably worth close to a trillion dollars. And again, they're doing everything from theme parks to Pixar to Marvel. So that's why I used to point to. Imagine if black people had a black owned media company that was spitting out of it the output that you get at Disney the black Pixar, the black Marvel, the black ESPN, right? Like, sounds exciting, easy to get people on board. Okay, fast forward to 2024, Disney's in the crapper. Like, <laughs> all of media's in the crapper. If you study media, it's like the whole business, the whole industry is broken. I did this walk a little bit earlier, but it was like, COVID broke theaters, digital broke radio and magazines, streaming broke television, what else is left? Um, yeah, maybe the only thing you have less is streaming, and streaming is broke. What'd you say? AI. Oh, AI is gonna break it all. <laughs> AI is already broken it all, right? <laughs> um, and streaming is broken because they didn't have to be profitable. Now they have to be profitable, which means you gotta cut costs, make less content. Then they got the writers and the producers strike, so now you have even less, right? So my entire business is in complete chaos. 
And then when you look at it, when people talk about how much is in chaos, people often point to Disney like, look at Disney. Even they're lost and don't know what to do. So it no longer makes sense to point to Disney <laughs> as like the thing that you want to be. And so stepping into this year, like the new language I'm using is like we are pioneering the new era of entertainment that the old guard has missed um, the way that consumers consume, discover and consume content. And we are going to lead the way for what this new era is in terms of what I believe is very much a people-centric way of consuming media. Gone are the days where you just push a magazine to somebody once a month when you want to, or you try to force them to show up for your television show every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Like, those days are gone. Everybody is curating their media experiences on their phone based on what they want to pay for and what they like, Spotify, Pandora, Netflix, et cetera. And so when you look at, this will be the end of what I say. When you look at the way that we're programming, we program, there's two kind of key pillars. There's five, but I only do two. One is you have to dominate in social media. Social media is the place where all content is discovered. OK, I say that, and now go look at every cable company that you know and go look at their social media page. They're not trying to play to win. They're sending promo clips and boring stuff. Like, so if you're not winning at that game, you might as well chalk it up. That's number one. Two is because people are curating their own personal experiences and consuming things on different platforms, you have to show up in as many expressions as possible and as many distribution platforms as possible. And so I'll give you one example. Our hit show is a show called Carisha Please. Carisha Please has no dedicated time. I always say, like, I don't know when Carisha's going to air. Nobody knows when Carisha's going to air. I don't know when Carisha's going to film. <laughs> to be able to even tell consumers, like, it's coming in three months, right? So one, there's no appointment viewing in that sense. Two, when we do film, it's usually 48 hours before we launch. 40, like, we'll do a couple of social promos. Those social promos will all trend. When Carisha launches, she's usually top 10 in Twitter. She's usually top 10 on YouTube, and she's usually top 10, if not top five, in podcasts. Find me a media company that can claim that they're putting out content that's winning in all of those different expressions, right? We have a signature event called Revolt World. So I can take Carisha to Revolt World, give a live experience, come out with a bunch of social clips, come out with audio, come out with video, and win. So that's what Disney ain't doing that. I don't know who's doing that, but that's what we're calling the new era of entertainment. So we've walked away from saying we're building the black Disney, and now we're just building something fresh and new, the way that we see the world evolving. And it's going to be a combination, really, of being in the right places, the right distribution, with 100%. the right content. 100%. OK. Uh, all the right content and all the expressions, if people want to listen, if people want to see, if people all of the different expressions. OK. So I, I do want to give people in the audience a chance to ask questions, but I've got a few more. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to be so long -winded. So I will. No, no, no. I, uh, it, so, uh, so I'm going to shift pretty uh, significantly away from where we've just been talking to uh, another implication coming out of COVID and, and an indication that society is going through some really tough times is, is the kind of mental health crisis that we have. And it's very noticeable that Revolt has been very front and center in talking about mental health when this is an area which has been highly stigmatized. So can you, can you walk us through how you came to take that position? Yeah, first of all, I would say I'm failing. Like, in my view, we're failing. Um, you know, when you looked at mental health challenges pre-COVID, numbers were something like one out of every four suffers from whatever, depression, anxiety, you name it. Then you go through COVID, those numbers have doubled, tripled, who knows, right? Um, and then you take black people, the community that I serve the most, and I don't know what the, the math is in terms of what percentage of black people suffer from depression versus everybody else. But what I do know is black people suffer more from freaking everything else that you can imagine than anybody. We have more heart attacks. We have more, more diabetes. We die during birth. Like, there's not one medical thing that I don't think black people suffer more than everybody else. So then it would not be hard to imagine <laughs> that when it comes to mental health, we are suffering more than anybody else. And then you just layer on 
COVID, we died more than anybody else. You layer on what we were dealing with during COVID, police brutality, watching people being murdered. Like we're dealing with it. Like my heart breaks for my team. I don't even go on social media that much because I don't want to see the mess. The heart and the brain was not designed to go from joy to anger to madness to like frustration to depression. To, your brain is not wired to do that every two seconds. Not only does my team have to do it, but then they have to go into the stuff that is painful, the police brutality, the murder, the whatever, and cover it. You got to sit in it. You got to produce a 30 minute show around it. You got to like, so just watching my teams makes me go, we have to be doing something for this, right? So I would say we've been present, um, but I would also say not present even remotely enough, not present enough for my teams, not present enough for my culture and my community. Um, if there's a place where I felt like I was failing and could do more, I'm sure there's like 10 other ones, but I would put that on my list of things that I'm like, I really got to find something to do about this. And I have to do it in a way that's entertaining because people just won't show up for good, healthy content. So I haven't quite cracked that nut yet. Okay. But thank you for giving me credit. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to ask one more question and then turn things over to the audience. Uh, and this will again be a, a, an abrupt shift. But uh, you, you gave some advice to people at lunch today, which I found really interesting. And I thought you could share, uh, which is you've had a spectacular career. You're, you're, you're a CEO of a, of a great company. You're young, you know, so you, you've had all the success. Um, and yet you described your journey not of one climbing ladders, but instead jumping ladders. Tell us, tell us why jumping ladders is the key to success. Yeah, sure. Um, so jumping ladders is a concept, I don't know where I found, but fell in love with it. Um, okay, we'll start with conventional wisdom. So conventional wisdom says the fastest way to the top of anything is you start at the bottom rung and you climb your way up, right? Um, unfortunately, that is not the truth. And so let's just use our presidents as an example. How many, in order for that to be true, in order to be president of the United States, you probably would have had to be serve in some local way, then you went to mayor, then you went to governor, then you went to house or senate, then you went to president. How many presidents in the history of the US do we think have, have walked that walk or even remotely close? Throw out a number, make it up. Whoever said three is a close, it's probably three or four at this point in time, right? If you just take the last president, Donald Trump, came from completely out, came from reality TV and became a president, right? That is the essential jumping ladders, right? So when you look at my career, it has all been based on jumping ladders. I started out doing global marketing. Well, first of all, you can say I started out at the CMC with this amazing group of people here, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> then I went from there to global marketing for Johnson & Johnson, right, post business school. Um, from there, I jumped to the agency side. How do I jump to the agency side? I'm convincing all of the people in the uh, agency side that I know how marketers think. I know how they build strategy. I know how they select ideas. And having someone inside with that understanding will help you sell ideas. They brought me on, gave me the Navy account, First year, we tripled the size of that business, right? OK, so businesses continue to grow. I started to get tired of being on the agency side, tired of making 30-second commercials that nobody wants to watch and everybody wants to ignore. And we start playing in this space of like branded entertainment. We do a mini movie with Lenny Kravitz. I was telling them we put Beats by Dre speakers inside of Chrysler, Dodges, Jeeps, et cetera, and we marketed them through music videos. And so now I'm comparing, right? I'm comparing the Will I Am video that has 30 million people who chose to watch it with a Chrysler front and center, and we pulled um, TV spots out of it to create commercials. I'm watching that. I'm watching them watch Carly Rae Jepsen and the fee I put in there that has 100 million views. Then if I play my commercial and get people to watch it, they're like, eh, I'm not trying to do it, right? So then I decide I want to go to the media space. No media background. So I jumped from being a president at an agency to the president of a media company. 
And how do I do it? I convince them you need to build an agency inside of your media company because the game is all about great ideas and media companies suck at great ideas and I can build you a hit factory inside if you allow me to build an agency. Um, and then from my time at the CMC, honestly, like I had learned the power of like great relationships and client relationships and media companies weren't great at that. So I used that to jump into the media side, right? Here I am running a media company, selling media plans and can't even read a media plan, right? I didn't have to come up through the bottom. I had people who could help teach me how to read the, the plans, right? I was, I was helping drive bigger picture things. And then, so the first time I've ever, this is the smallest ladder I've ever jumped. This is the first time I've ever stayed in the same industry from medical devices to advertising to media. And before I was more digital media, now this was TV based, TV anchored media. So it's the first time in my career I've actually ever stayed um, in the same lane, but the TV lane was different for me, right? Um, but very similar, I could convince them, I know how to build an agency inside of this company, y'all need it. The future is digital, and I've been running digital at my last company for the last 10 years. I say all that to say, I have tricked people into hiring me by convincing them that the thing they need to power their growth is the thing that I have, and nobody who has come up through the chains of these things can have or do what I do. And so that's how I have jumped ladders, and that's why I believe my career has moved as quickly as it could, because I wasn't focused on trying to convince the same people to see me differently. I was selling myself differently to new people. So given the way you started the answer to this question, yeah. Uh, is the next ladder you jump to president? <laughs> I hope not, Lord God. I'm like, <laughs> I am a, a very much a man of faith. I go wherever I believe God is. But you know, when you say that, like, if, again, I'm not trying to be religious, but anybody who knows the story of the Bible, Jesus who's getting ready to go be crucified, and he's like praying, and it's like, do I have to do this? Like, that's what it would be like if I felt like I had to go be president. Take this cup from me, I do not want it. <laughs> <laughs> but I would go do it if, if I had to. <laughs> okay. Questions from the audience? No questions? I didn't say anything? No, you don't get to what I was going to say. Well, he looked just like you. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say, um, I used to work here with Tavio, and I've said it to you personally many times before. I'm very proud of you. Like, I saw you when you were here. I told you back then. I saw greatness in you, and you you are a great man, and you, because you stop being selfish, my 17-year-old gets to see someone like him see him mm -hmm. So I just want to say thank you for mm -hmm. not being selfish. Sorry, I'm just yeah. proud of you. Um, but my question is, you said earlier something about um, younger people and really focusing on them and that sort of thing. Do you feel like there's a pocket within media for people of an older generation, like Generation X and stuff, because like you see the Shay Shays and Tabitha Browns and stuff like that that are making a huge splash, not just with our generation, but with younger people, that's their auntie and uncle and stuff. Do you see you guys leveraging the older generation at all? Um, okay, I'm gonna try to respond three things fast. One, do I see Revolt doing it? No. So when I was talking about Black Disney, I was trying to program to very much youth culture and what I would call broader African-American adults. Um, as the money that was coming in is shifting and it's not there in the way that it was, I have to get very focused on one audience. And the audience that I'm choosing is older Gen Z because brands are always gonna wanna spend money on the youth, that's one. Two, no matter how old we get, we all wanna be young, right? So that's why Pepsi's whole, like the next, the, the next generation, they'd have like an 80 year old grandma in it, right? Young was a feeling. When I was, um, I ran marketing at Jeep or advertising for Jeep for several years, did a whole bunch of Chrysler stuff. Every brief I got would say 35 to 55, and every answer we gave them was a bunch of kids 18 to 30, because Everybody wants to be doing the cool stuff that's so anyways. As much as I love them, I think I can bring them in through a very youth perspective, so that's one. Two, that's just Datavia. If I had more money, I'd be doing it differently, but I don't. I actually think there's a massive opportunity for Gen X and boomers, driven by two things. One, they're the only ones who watch cable TV these days, right? So like, 
if I'm running a real cable channel, I'm just trying to figure out how to program to them. And then you're also seeing um, their stuff pop, like the Golden Bachelor, right? Like you can see people very intentionally programming to these groups because they're the only ones that are there. And so I actually feel like they should see and have a resurgence, just not going to be me for now. And then the last thing I'll just say is thank you, Queen. I appreciate you. It's funny because, you know, coming here has been amazing. And I was telling um, Dean that it feels like I don't feel things deeply. Um, and I'm not feeling this deep, but it's enough of a feeling for me to know that it's special and that it's different and that it's unique. And I was trying to like place it like what makes it that a big piece of it is you can draw a straight line from me and the CMC to here. So it's very easy to compare how far I've come. Um, and then I wanted to tell a story that was like, there's a bunch of people who didn't see me being here. I can actually remember Fuqua was the first school that I got into. And I remember a few rumors around school, people being like, he only got in there because he works here. He only got in here because he doesn't deserve it, right? It's one of the reasons why I ended up going to Stanford, because nobody could say that about me. Um, but then as I was thinking about that story, I was like, but it's not true, because the people who I worked with all saw me. The people who I worked with all believed in me. So that story couldn't ring true. There were a ton of people in this building who believed in a little 21-year-old kid that was like, I'm going to business school this year. <laughs> um, so anyways, I know it. I feel it. I appreciate it. Y'all being here and your support is just validation for something that has been true for decades. So anyways, thank you. Please. I'm going to tell you I'm Robert, I'm from uh, Cameroon. Uh, Cameroon. And uh, I love uh, media uh, community agency. I love the magazine. I'm listening to you. I'm just like, that's my mind. That's, that's how I think. And uh, I just wanted to ask you in terms of like, when you talk about things like Wakanda, I feel like part of the success was just that reaching the African American culture with the real African culture as well, at least in a spiritual way. And uh, I want to ask, like, in your strategy, are you looking to like doing more content that is kind of like reaching this African American culture with the people that are in Africa right now? Thank you. The last part was African American culture with Africa. Is that what it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we very much believe when you look at our um, strategic plan, you look at the kind of like visionary strategic pillars. The very first one is go global. Um, we believe that we have to be global for scale and for all of these things, but um, we also just think that there's so much written, richness in diasporic stories that go untold. Like, I'm always like, look, man, I'm the dude who somebody give me a billion dollars because I'm about to turn the things that they made footnotes into freaking blockbuster hits. Like, let's talk about Mansa Musa, the richest man that ever touched the planet, a black, plant, black man. Ain't nobody telling his story. Let's tell the story of the Haitian Revolution, the only slaves that kick, kick the colonizers' butts and send them back packing, right? Who's telling that story? Like, it's not just about the stories in Atlanta and New York and LA. Our stories are rich and they are hidden everywhere. Um, so anyways, a big belief is we need to be global in terms of scale, but also in terms of storytelling. And we believe that um, black people in the States can be inspired by stories that come out of Cameroon in the same way that black people in Ethiopia can be inspired by stories that come out of New Orleans. I see you pointing, Steven. OK, then. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I'm so, yeah. so just in your mind, mirrors and leaders, um, what you say earlier, do you think that the state of hip hop today is positive for the black community? Yeah, it's, it's, um, you can't answer that question because the state of hip hop is so freaking expansive. Like, by definition, I am hip hop. I am hip hop. Tattooed out, CEO, like, I am hip hop. I think it's positive, right? You want to see, like, take all the people who were making hip hop back in the 90s when we were growing up. Jay Z, their media empires that are feel, feel, um, that are feeding hundreds of families and making massive dents and building wealth. Like, so it all just depends on what your lens of hip hop is. My lens of hip hop is that it is expansive, that it touches every single fabric of our culture that we can imagine. If we want to just go down into when people usually do, like 
the music. How do I feel about the music? Um, first of all, I run a hip hop network, so I have to say I love it. But <laughs> um, two, what I would say is, if you want to know my real truth, is I don't listen to that much hip hop music right now. Um, in order to do what I'm doing and live the life that I want to live and accomplish the, miss the mission and the assignment and the purpose that is on my life, I have to do everything I can to tweak and optimize to be my best self. That means the food I put in my body. That means the things that I study. It means the content that I listen to. And so the vibration that's in a lot of hip hop music right now does not resonate or speak to my spirit. Now, after this, you want to go to the club and listen to hip hop music and dance, like I'm all in it, right? But if you just want to ask me when I'm at home, what am I listening to? Jesus. Like, <laughs> it's gospel music, it's Afro beats, it's, you know what I mean? Maybe a little bit of R&B and soul, but like I'm going to stay on my vibration at all times. And I just think hip hop doesn't do that um, often and then Again, the core problems, I told you we're trying to lead multiple revolutions. One of them is this revolution around the stories that black people put out about themselves. And when you don't have control of green light power, do you know what green light power is? Those are the people who get to say, this song gets made, this artist gets signed, this show gets made, et cetera. When the people who have green light power don't look like you, they are green lighting things that don't show you in the best light, right? And so that's why it's important to have black owned media companies like Revolt so that we can then look through a different lens and say, we need more of this, more of this, and more of that. I am perpetually frustrated by a music industry that would allow black people to only majority put out music that talks about our experience, which is all true, so I'm not mad at it, but sex, drugs, murder, and you know what would be cool if you did that for everybody else? All of the music that comes out of like Latina, like let that be that. All of the music that comes out of the country, let that be that. But in my world, you are only allowing this type of music and death and destruction to come out of music that comes from people who look like me, and I have a problem with that. I don't know if I answered your question, but I think hip hop is big and it's great. <laughs> and I think in general, it's massively positive what people are doing, buying soccer companies. Um, yeah, like the way people are moving is really, really incredible right now. It's fun to watch, uh, but the music, I think, yeah, it doesn't feel equal. It doesn't feel fair. It doesn't feel right. Something smelly about it. Okay, we have time for one last question. Make it good, you're the last one. <laughs> um, my name is Gabby. Um, what is it, Gabby? Hi, I just want to start by being grateful, starting gratitude. Thank you for your time. So many gems, I'm, I'm grabbing with them um, as I speak. But I'm curious as to, I want to bridge your MBA experience, really your education journey with the impact that you've been able to obviously make in your career. And I'm curious if any particular classes, any mentors, any experiences that you can also draw a connection to in terms of your success. Yeah, sure. Um... I'm going to do this walk. Maybe it's going to take a second. You're the last one, so I'm going to... Maybe we have time. Okay. I want to start out with... Um, I want to start out by talking about like identifying what makes us uniquely us, our puzzles, and then who knows? It might be a big mishmash of stuff. Okay, so the first thing is, um, again, I go back to this idea that like the goal in, oh, I can do it this way. The goal in life is to figure out who you are and what makes you special. Um, I always say things and I don't think I said it in this room, so I'm going to say it here. If you want to understand the purpose of a thing, you have to look at the designer's intent, right? So when you look at a bumblebee, a bumblebee is designed to have wings and a furry body. Why? Because its purpose is to go from flat, take pollen from flower to flower to flower. If you want to understand the purpose of a car, it's got a body, doors, four wheels, and a steering wheel. 
Right, why? Because his job is to get you from whatever place you're going, where you are to wherever you're going safely. So if I want to understand the purpose of me or the purpose of a thing, I have to understand the designer's intent. And so the first part that I would say that I spent definitely from the time I got into business school, probably 21, 22 on, trying to understand who the heck I am. And not just like, I want to know my gifts. Like, I want to know my gifts and be able to spit them out. Like, when you see Superman, the man is like, I shoot lasers out my eyeballs. I fly from here to there. I can stop a speed and train. Like, I want to be able to speak to my gifts that the designer gave me that concretely and that easily. And then again, once I know them, I am trying to feed them over and over and over and over again, which brings me to my next point, which is, the world will try to convince you that in order to be great, you must be something else. And it is a lie. It is a lie from the pit of hell. The only way to be great is to figure out who you are, what's unique about you, and lean into all of that. And so any puzzle that I see that doesn't accept this thing is clearly not my puzzle to solve. Um, so the first piece is just spend a lot of time understanding who I am and how I optimize the man that God made me to be. Two, if you now we're gonna go on the journey, always in my heart, like I knew, um, she said greatness. I knew that God had more in store for me. I knew that there was something that I was supposed to accomplish. I was intrigued by this idea of like being an entrepreneur, running companies. I didn't believe government created change. Trump changed that. I now see that government can do a whole heck of a lot. And so, <laughs> so, now, so now I value it differently. But before it was like business is the only way to change. I always had that call in my life and in my heart. Um, and I knew I was supposed to be an entrepreneur. So from the time I was at Stanford, so I graduated from Stanford in, oh, when did I graduate? Oh, six, so 25 years old. So from the time I was 25, I just knew I was supposed to be a CEO of a fast growing company. Okay, so from 25 to get to that dream, it took from 25 to 40, 15 years. So what happened along the way? Two things, from my perspective going forward, me bumping my head against the wall over and over and over and over again, feeling like this isn't it. Like trying to start my own companies, I'm working at J&J, &J, starting trying to start my own companies and like doing everything that I can to manifest this thing that I just knew was in me, but I didn't know how to get there. 15 years, okay. Then you get to Revolt, CEO, 40, 41 maybe, I don't really remember. And um, looking back, Queen, it felt like every single thing that I had ever been through was preparation for this moment. Every single thing, whether it was learning how to manage client relationships from the CMC, whether it was learning how my future clients, marketers, learn to think so that I could speak their language, talk to them, and ideally develop strategic plans that were better than the ones their own teams were developing for themselves, whether it was um, I now had to take revolt to lead them to become digital. Well, the job before that, somebody handed me a digital media business. I knew nothing what to do with it, and I fixed it in, what, in eight years. Um, building an agency inside of a media company. I got to practice doing that for eight years. So by the time I sat in that seat at Revolt, and it was like, oh, this is my moment, I had no fear. I felt like I was fully prepped and fully prepared, even to the point where um, and I won't talk about this long, but like, you know, our, my company went through a massive crisis last year. When I tell you that there was not, not one, not one day where I woke up saying, should I be here? Should I do this? Should I run? Every day I woke up anchored, confident, unwavering, and not only feeling like this was my puzzle to solve, but that I was uniquely qualified to solve this particular puzzle. Put 10 people next to me and ask me who's better to solve the hell that we've been through in the last few months better than me, and I will tell you good luck because I, my, my preparation, my life, what I've done, everything tells me that I was built for this moment. And so that's how I connect my life and what I've done to where I am right now. So.
So, Detavio, let me, let me just close by thanking you again and uh, thanking you for discovering your gifts. Mm -hmm. Thank you for using those gifts to transform society in positive ways. Um, and thank you for demonstrating what it means to be a leader of consequence, which is what the world needs so badly. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, you all. Mind.